The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. I believe that God is prepping us to get ready big time. You know what? It, it, when you consider the Exodus, the people went through great hardship prior to being free. In fact, you, you could say it's true that everybody who's been delivered has gone through some pretty, pretty um, tough things in life. Our case is no different. Our whole lives, I don't know about you, but my whole life has been a challenge. It really has. It's been challenging. And every step of the way is preparing me for what I'll have to face just like in the Exodus, just as you read it. Everything they went through, they were slaves. Hard labor, right? Hard labor. Think about this. Hard labor. Slaves. When they were delivered, the walk, that long walk, had to be nothing to them. They were making brick, right? They were making brick. They were doing things as slaves continuously. And that long walk, for 40 years, I never heard anybody say, you know, I never, I never read in the Bible where anybody said, you know, my legs hurt. They complained about other things. Yes. In fact, they were so disinterested in their own bodies. They looked at all these external things to complain about. Hey, we've had the same food for a long time. We need some meat. Now, if your if your body's aching and everything else, surely they would say, Lord, deliver us from this. That's not what they were saying. They were strong. They were absolutely strong and ready for that exodus. Now, I believe in our lifetime, the Lord has been preparing us for what we must go through. And if you look at the challenges you've had in life, if we were to compare the challenges that we've had in life, we would see similarities. And in those similarities, you would also extract something of the future from it. Many of us now, now, I'm going to talk about some of this tonight. In our lives, we've been challenged through many of us through relationships. We have it's been one of the biggest challenges. I've noticed that much of the, the Christians that believe have gone through some very challenging situations and relationships. We've had to, be, it, of all things we had to deal with, dealing with people has been one of the biggest issues. We've had to know and learn plenty of types of people you ever wonder why think about it many of you have been you've been backstabbed uh so many times you've been drawn into situations many of you have probably even you know you, you may have said something to someone you shouldn't have said and you learned a big lesson in doing so anybody ever get drawn into a conversation you're trying to act like the world you know you're growing in the world you begin to emulate behaviors of the world that gets you in trouble and then you say to yourself, I'm never doing that again. Anybody ever confronted about something they knew, right? And they they told it to the wrong people and it got back to the source and you said, I'm never doing that again. Anybody ever trust someone? And when you trust that person, that person directly betrays you of that trust in the worst way, right? We've gone through these things. Most of our hardships have been with people. We can also admit that much of some of the corrective measures that have been applied to our lives had to be applied because we knowingly did things we knew we shouldn't have done. Anybody ever tamper in areas of life they shouldn't have tampered in? We know we, you know, we're aware of our sin, but we premeditated on that sin, talked ourselves into doing it, justifying it, and, and did it and paid a price. You know, people to your left and to your right, they didn't pay a big price, but you did. You paid a big price. It's almost like uh, everybody else got away with something, but you didn't. You got caught. You had to pay the. Uh, you had to pay the pipe. All that was necessary. And if and if it gives you a hint about anything, your future dealings, because you've had so many trials with people, your future is going to be faced with people of a different sort, people with fine-tuned communication skills, right? people who can draw you astray in a heartbeat but throughout your life the lord has been fortifying you against such think about that you know how to recognize people 
There was a time when you thought you could recognize people, but you turned out to be wrong a few times. What did we say? No, I'm not doing that anymore. Misjudge of character. Adopting others' sayings. Oh, this is a big one. How many of you have adopted something somebody else said, and you advocated for what somebody else said, only to find out years later it was absolutely wrong? Anybody ever do that? So the Lord has taught us when we're dealing with people that we still have to trust him. We cannot throw caution to the wind and start trusting a person blindly that we have to often refer back to him. We also learn that if we don't get it from the source, we simply don't have it. And it seems like good people, as well as the bad people, were used to manipulate us in some way. So let me give you a hint as to why. Dealing with people is a very, you know, it's a benign statement. But when you have to deal with people who are incredibly wise in darkness, that is a challenge. That's a challenge. Have you noticed that people have excuses for not, uh, uh, well, for not thanking Christ? Have you noticed that? They have an excuse for that. They have an excuse for not, you, you know, totally submitting themselves unto the Lord. And, well, we could, we could sit here and name quite a few things. But these people we have interactions with and have had these interactions with and the ones we trusted so willingly, the ones we adopted and trusted where they were going betrayed us in the worst way we found them out to be not what they said they were we found them out to be uh damaged for our own lives and then the penalty comes back and we're the ones who paid for it. lesson learned right and it really caused a great caution to be within a lot of people to not want to mess with how many people are at the point you can't trust people enough to have interactions these free interactions uh, with others you're very skeptical you nitpick and you have to do that. Um, think of this future setting, if you would. In the Bible, it says that many are going to worship the dragon and worship the beast. That's what the Bible says. In the Bible, it says all will come against Jerusalem. That's what the Bible says. So these people who are intellectuals, who are quite convincing, who seemingly have knowledge in, in, in many different facets of life they're going to be highly deceitful according to the word of god give the beast right the beast comes forward and by means of the miracles he was able to do in front of the people he deceived the people he deceived them you're not to be deceived you're to see it you're not to be deceived you're not to be tricked you're not to be drawn down the wrong highway you're to have the experience to know nope i can't i'm not going to follow that guy something is wrong and how many of you you saw something wrong, but you couldn't speak out because you didn't want to deal with the backlash that would come from so many who did believe in those people. How many were caught in that scenario where your very environment, your social environment would not permit you turning away? You were trapped because the Lord knew you had to add strength in your life, add character to your life so that you could both recognize that darkness and fully turn away from it. Isn't that simple? Because we're headed into a world where people worship the dragon, they worship the beast. That means they're already thinking in line with the beast. They have the number of his name. These are people who are totally converted to the sinful aspects of love. These are people who will, if they could, deceive everybody and anybody. It's coming. And these people are not going to be, you know, many people are going to find themselves totally taken by these individuals. You're talking about some highly manipulative folks who are tenacious in character, who won't back down, who will cause grievances everywhere they go. And they're going to have a loyalty to this world on parallel. I mean, on parallel. How do we stand against something like that? We have to be within the confines of truth. But how do we have that truth? There's certain things about the word of God we must know. We have to have we have to have these reminders. They'll come back to you. You're going to see the likeness of those who backstab you in life and the faces of those you may meet in the future. You'll see it. You've been prepared to march and to not complain about the march. You will have been conditioned to march. To go forward. Condition that is real preparatory time that we've been going through. And that's the reason for a few things. 
this highly deceitful world with elements in it that we can't imagine right now they will surface very quickly and when they do they're not going to be kind or will they have compassion does gasoline fuel have compassion no it does not gasoline does not have compassion you try to light gasoline on fire it's going to do what it does neither will these people have compassion compassion the bible describes them as having been you know their conscience seared with a hot iron twice dead and plucked up by the roots in control of many different aspects of creation and be challenged well the exodus i think you guys are prepared for that but you have one more hurdle you have a big hurdle we have another life lesson to learn god doesn't want to lose you he doesn't want to lose me he doesn't want to lose any of us but there are elements out there that have been given fully over to darkness they are against you your father in heaven wants you to live as players he wrote that down for us today, to have life to have life more abundantly not to be victims the entire time through but to stand on our faith with his word because a great trying you're about to see now now let me explain this to you those in israel they're going to go through they have been through some extreme issues right extreme and god says they went through that because they were naturally a stiff-necked people they weren't ready to accept anything anybody had to say those are the, the these people that you'll meet will have great placement in the world the question will be how many of us are going to lose ourselves being in proximity to these people will we have the know-how to make some adjustments all right guys now before i go a step further how many of you understand the state of affairs right now today? As far as, as far as, if you're detected by some of these characters in the world, how many have an idea as to how you're perceived? Do you guys think you're noticeable? You think you stick out like a sore thumb? You do. You really do. You do. A lot. You're recognizable. Many of you as believers, I can't say everybody, because there might be one or two here that's not quite into it. Right? They're not, they haven't put it together yet. They're still growing. Still, they may, there may be some here who made it in who should not be here in this place. The character of these folks that are in our time right now is something different with some of them, not all, just some of them. Something deep within them driving them in your direction to attempt to cause you to change your mind, to make you void what the Lord had you walk through and to fully accept that indeed it's man who will deliver you. How many of you can see that? Especially in this political field. They need you to think and process information a certain way. But within the political field are people whose sole purpose is to get you to boy grace out of your life. How many of you would voluntarily allow someone to make you void grace in your life because if they can make you void grace in your life then you know the outcome though you void grace when mercy is withdrawn you will not be embraced you will have pushed away the very salvation you were sent here to fully obtain so you know that they want you to stumble trip up they want you to become violent they want you to speak on their subjects you guys think that the uh standard populace could be ready for that it takes training identification discernment it does they absolutely want you corrupted this entire political fiasco is drawing in people left and right it's causing a type of purpose for them to be seen the lord teaches us when the foundation is messed up the house is messed up right the foundation of the world right now his foundation is away from those things. They, they have pulled everything away from the creator. They have redefined what this country actually stands for. And when people start, start, you start embedding yourself with these folks, isn't it true that you begin to think like they think? Isn't it true that you start having issues? Some of you have, have gone a bit deeper with these people, right? Talk their conversation, agree with them on occasion thought there was no consequence but the true consequence was you started changing inside and why is it a telltale sign of this sporadic 
violence. Have you known Satan, your adversary, the devil, desires you to void the grace out of your life? He wants you guys to look inwardly, to save yourself, to have a motivation, right? To only look after yourself. And for the most part, that's how society is being grown. That each individual would only look after themselves. These clever sayings like this, well, you have to, you know, have your own decision. Is that what people say? You have to take care of your own and everything. And have you noticed when you attempt to do that, things stop working so well in your life? One problem can lead to a strange issue. Have you guys been noticing that? They want you outside of God's grace. Darkness knows the exodus is here. He knows it. And he wants you to recant your faith, to make void your faith. I hope, I hope, through actually analyzing, seeing how things are operating, you can see it, that no one can ever make you cast away grace, ever. Now, of course, tonight, as we talk about this subject of the Exodus, we also have to talk about some of the more extraordinary things that deal with Exodus. Because God did something before they marked. Not only did he have them be physically conditioned, not only did he have them be mentally conditioned. And I say mentally conditioned because, think of this, I mean, our society today, what we're going through is just like the Exodus. I see it because there are too many parallels. Imagine Imagine if you would for a moment, seeing like you were invited to something and you saw some sort of a political prep rally. You're in this prep rally and all of a sudden a storm comes and that storm starts to just destroy the building where the pep rally is held. The people are not harmed, but everything they touch is harmed. Would that make you second guess? Many a uh, life choices if you could witness things like that what if like in the exodus back in the past god's people were under duress they had been praying and the lord didn't release them like many people are doing now in desperate times just then not the egyptians just then had a, they had it hard but they prayed some of them didn't pray but they were able to see and then all of a sudden plagues to the very land, plagues come to the very land that God's children were. Those plagues begin to destroy everything around them. I think that'll, you know, cause a person to, in, in, for example, Windows 11 or something like that to examine. You know, back to the plagues. Plagues hit. God's people see it. God's people pray. They're moved just as much as the Egyptians are. More plagues hit. God's people see it. The death angel comes. They're scared to death. But something happens when the death angel comes. A special preparation stops death from going into their homes to destroy their firstborn. The firstborn is the most precious thing to them. It's what they're really, they have a heart towards the firstborn, right? They have a heart. They also have an inheritance with the firstborn. So it means something. So God has special preparation to stop at a specific point. Now, all the while, they're seeing the Egyptians fall like flies. They're seeing the duress of the Egyptians. Some of them do care about the Egyptians, but the plagues happen anyway. Did you hear me? Some of them cared about the life of the Egyptians, but the plagues, the devastations, the destruction came anyway essentially breaking a trance some of them were in. See, some of them were so steeped in Egypt, they wanted to be a part of Egypt, but Egypt would not let them become a part of it. Sound familiar? Some of you wanted to be a part of the world, but the world said, nope. Every time uh, some opportunity came around, so did a trouble, an obstacle. Something stopped you from your opportunity, didn't it? It stopped you, kept you away from it. No matter how much you wanted to be a part of the world, no matter how much you wanted to be just like somebody in the world, something happened, broke your heart, made you mad, didn't it? Something always had to happen in your life and you had no idea. You had no idea that the Lord, and that that's part of his salvation. That's part of his operation for salvation. And it's heartbreaking. 
But when it breaks, when you see those devastations, but you don't see those devastations around your own people, something in you breaks. You start to realize the truth of truths. See, before the truth comes, people fight tooth and nail for their own view. Do you know that? They fight for what they believe in, their causes. Sound familiar, guys? A setup. That's a setup. Just like the Exodus. When something broke inside the people after certain devastations really took them, when they saw Egypt fall, yet God's people went forward, something broke inside of people. An instant decision was made. See, it's true. Some of you can't make a decision right now, and it's okay to admit that. But you can't make that full decision. You love the Lord, yes. You believe in His Word, yes. But for some reason, you cannot make that decision of absolute and total commitment to Him. And when I say total commitment to Him, I'm not talking about, uh, you know, being a part of a something that holds a structure up or something. Something that adds balance to the issue. No, no. Something is coming to uproot what we trust in the most. That happened in your lives. In my life, there were things, I remember when I was young, there, there were quite a few things I wanted to do in the world. I did. First, I wanted to be a cartoonist. I did. I even had Disney contacted my parents that something happened. See, I'm a military brat, and so deployments came often. And sometimes, uh, uh Lots of overseas deployments came. They always interrupted things. It wasn't um, two years after that Disney approached again. And it just so happened during that time. We had to, we had to go through it, uh, undergo a, um, a, you know, a change of scenery, location change that lasted, uh, that, that was fairly quick, unexpected, but just messed up my plans. That was the second time. I later found out the Lord was protecting me. Then I was very interested in technology. I went all the way. Then I was very interested in some other disciplines. Two of them, I went all the way again. And every single time, I would gain the credentials. But this time, I was bound under an oath I could not break. You could say that the armed services, they were used as a vessel themselves. Right? Many of you have such similar circumstances. Many of you thought things were quite unfair, but you've been kept. You had to be kept. See, many of you may not understand what's out there in this realm of reality. But for example, there are theories that you guys have about what exists and what does not exist, and some of those things are not theory. You think they are, but they're not. Some of those things are absolute. Being kept. Being kept that your soul would be secure. Keep that in mind that you were kept. You weren't held back. You were kept. All of us were chastised, but you were kept. Go look at Hollywood, the music industry, all these things. People in this country, in America, basically, there's a few things they want. In the beginning, they want wealth. Wealth is one of them, right? Well, they want to matter. They want a position in the place. They want their position in Egypt. And the Lord said, no, 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 preserved. During the time of Egypt, there's some characters you can read about who were aspiring to be great in Egypt. They really were. And they were not from Egypt. Those, this guy, this one gentleman pursued all those people the best way he could. This one person attempted to corrupt in your life. You've gone through similar things. Satan has lost and lost and lost when I come back from this break right keep that in mind because we have to talk about the future what you've been kept from in truth with the parallels of exodus how the Lord prepared you and trained you and increased you for a very specific time that, it, that many will not survive Though those people that are near you next to you your friends who drifted away from the lord right they still may be your friends but they don't love the lord the way you do they have a loyalty towards something they can't explain just like us we're loyal to our father's word and of course satan wants to change that he knows the time that's coming up he wants you corrupted backslidden right to go back to whatever you were doing 
so he can magnify your sufferings. Hopefully you won't let him. How many of you guys feel like you're you're waiting for something? Huh? How many feel like that? Anybody? Huh? You feel like uh, you're you've been feeling like that for a long time. You don't know when it's coming. You feel like you're waiting for something. Do you not know the anticipation back in the time of Exodus? Likely the exact same thing. Now, what are the chances that the entire body of Christ feels like they're waiting on something? And it's it's very strange. It's not like you're waiting on somebody to show up at your house. No, it's one of those uh, active sentiments, right? Something that won't go away. That's a telltale sign that a call is about to go out. And when that call goes out, there's going to be a couple warnings. Then you're gone. Listen to me. During the Exodus, Moses, when he came back, because they had a hint of Moses in the beginning, just a hint. But when he came back, he came back with a declaration. He came back with a declaration that God was about to free all of them. It's a pretty powerful declaration, right? In your lives, you have heard many people. Why is it that at this point in time, everybody is coming back with declarations? They're more authoritative than ever saying, I mean, they're, people are quite bold these days saying, hey, God is about to move. See, back in the day, they didn't say that. They say, get ready, didn't they? You heard that get ready thing a lot. Get yourselves prepped and ready, get ready. That's not what you're hearing now. You're hearing now, more and more, this different sentiment that God's about to do something. Same thing. Moses came back, and when he said this, disasters came. Oops. Just like our time. When the sentiment changed in this these modern days, right? Didn't everything in the earth start to go haywire? Oh, yes, it did. Yes, it did. And greater and greater things are coming. The truth is, they're going to get quite scary. But they need to be. If they're not scary, they won't stick. If they don't stick, our minds drift off back into, you know, a coma or something. We do. We drift. We go back to our shells and we're back to life as usual. Something different. Something different. The Lord will do. Right? Something he will only do in the last days and right before deliverance. The disasters are coming. I wouldn't be surprised. If it, oh, and by the way, did you notice Pharaoh during the time when Moses came back? Pharaoh was stubborn, was he not? He was also a bit harsher. So why would you expect your situation here to be any different? It was almost like God gave us a formula of deliverance. And that formula has been the same all throughout the Word of God. Same formula. And we know by reading the Word of God, it says God said he changes not. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. These Declarative things that people often speak, you probably even sense them within yourself. The get ready message, that's one thing. But now you're, you're physically looking for something. You know something is going to take place. And you know it's not going to be one thing. It's going to be a multitude of things. It causes you to become to be reserved, more cautious, because it's real. The words are coming back. People are becoming more declarative as far as what the Holy Spirit is giving people, what people get from prayers and things like that. And you're actively looking for commotions. And you're actually beginning to endure a change, a physical change in the earth. I mean a notable physical change in the earth. And it's caused you to alter how you live your life. That's one of the biggest things. That's one of the biggest things. And we do have stubborn leadership. See, there were people in Egypt that liked the leadership because they wanted to be close to the leadership. They wanted to establish. There were even people there that said, hey, Moses, we wanted to be like it used to be before they took away our materials to make the brick, before the labor became more intensive. We want it back to the way it used to be because ever since you showed up, things have been getting tougher. You know, that happened to them. So not only did they behold the dangers, the destructive forces taking place in Egypt, but things were rougher on them. It's like now, people are cautious these days, aren't they? Cautious. The world pronounces that all the time. 
things are not the same. They're, they're doing everything they can do to get everything back to the way it used to be, and it's not going back. We're going forward. It's not going back. This is about deliverance. Not, we're not going back to kick our feet up, right? Sit on a beach, have a party like back in the 50s and 60s, or for some of you back in the 80s and 90s. That's not going to happen. We're going forward. Because every time you think, but, oh, yeah, things will go back to the way they were. If there are disruptions that take place. Haven't you noticed? Just like in the time of the deliverance of the people of God in Egypt, many of them wanted things to go back to easy street, manageable street. Many of them said, hey, at least we knew what to expect. We don't know what to expect out here. And when the danger came, they were scared. They went from having a routine, just like us. We have routines. All of us have a routine. We trust the routine. We wake up, we eat breakfast, have coffee, do what we do. We begin to plan our day. We have that liberty, that freedom. Things may be tough, but we can still do things in our freedom. And we have become content living under the foot of several different forces. We have a routine. And the routine is about to get a big disruption. The Lord must do this. This is part of deliverance. If he does not, when the call comes to go, you know how Jesus said, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, he said, those in Judea flee into the mountains. If he does not, if he does not cause it to be a little challenge, we're not going to move. We're not going to flee anywhere. We're not going to go anywhere. That's an example because he didn't tell us to flee. But what I'm saying is, if he does not change the conditions that we live on, we're not going anywhere. We won't believe anything to go forward beyond where we are. These destructive forces came. And what did God's people see? They saw the place that fed them, the place that housed them, the place of many generations of them, the place they were used to, the place of their labors. They saw it slowly eroding away, being destroyed. They beheld it. And what do we see? Huh? What do we see? Every single president that comes on the scene, whether good or bad, they do things, and it will not stick. I think one thing people haven't caught on to is this. A president does not have a lifetime term. And after that person is gone, somebody else comes in and undoes whatever that person did. And it's getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And we're seeing it. Now time will soon come where you will not look. You'll see such devastations in the place that housed you and clothed you and all this, that, and the other that an internal break will take place because no one can trust instabilities. No one can. And at that point, the call will go out at that point. Doesn't it line up like this in the Bible? Once that destruct the destructive thing come, the true call comes out. The real call comes out and it says, get up and get ready. Go. And the people listen. See, if that call came right now, nobody would, why would we listen? We would not be convinced that we're even in the right time. Although we sense it, although we can feel it, the declarative statements are coming back and everything else, we would question it, wouldn't we? You would wonder, is this it or not? Well, you know, I need more, more to happen before that takes place. And everybody has a theory. I noticed something. In Egypt, before they were delivered, everybody had a theory too. But after God did what he did, nobody had a theory. They didn't. Even the ones that didn't want to leave got up and left, didn't they? They got up and left. Huh? The demonstration was so powerful. They got up and left. The whole point was to get them, not to force them to go, but to train them to go in the right direction. Are we not children? And does not our father have a statement that he gave in his in, in that Bible? Train a child up in the way that he should go and he will not depart from it. Wouldn't our father do the exact same thing? He gave that by inspiration of the Holy Spirit to mankind. So why would he differ in his treatment of us? If he told us to do it, you better believe he's going to implement the same thing. That's where it came from. They saw it. They saw destructive things happen. They saw it until they could not deny it. And the plagues got worse and worse and worse and worse. You know, in the Bible it says, Come out of her, my people, be not partakers of her sins, that you, will, that you won't partake of her plagues. Interesting. Eh? Parallels are astonishing. Amazing. It's deliverance once again, isn't it? Also in Revelation, it says there was silence in the heavens about the space of a half an hour. 
Everything stopped. No wind stirred upon the earth. In one place it says day or night. Didn't stir upon the earth. No winds, no fires, no nothing stirred upon the earth. All went out. And the designated tribes of the earth took flight. That's what it says. I'll just refer to it as it says that. I think it's beautiful. Because it says the four mighty men who expelled the Nephilim held back both fires and winds that nothing would stir upon the earth. Day or night, dark or light, nothing stirred upon the earth until the designated tribes of the earth took flight. That word flight was deliverance. Everything stopped. Imagine the impossible taking place. The world cannot move, but you can move. And immediately in Revelation, after reading that, all of a sudden a bunch of people standing, a number that no man can number, John saw. Where do they come from? What did the angel say? Because the angel got excited and said, John, where do these come from? John said, Sir, thou knowest. He said, These are they who came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes white in the blood of the Lamb. The angel couldn't wait to tell John who these people were. And if they came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes white in the blood of the Lamb, they finished their race. They did not quit. They finished their race. Deliverance deliverance that was full deliverance full deliverance is what that was the lord demonstrated yet again he even says that in the book of ezekiel and isaiah that he will demonstrate again come on now those those should be familiar to everybody that he for a second time would demonstrate just like in the time of egypt of the hebrew He's going to demonstrate again. It's coming. Oh, it's coming. Why do you think Satan is so desperate to trip you up? To try to involve you in some sort of violent thing. To draw you into anything he can draw you into. To make you step into pride. To make you void. Make you void your position in the kingdom. He's giving it everything he has. He's using every scenario to draw you in. Haven't you guys noticed I'm never compromised by politics? I see it all the time, but I'm never compromised by it. Doesn't matter, I don't walk around grumpy, angry, pointing fingers, doing all this. I don't do that. Why? Because I believe the word of my father. You might want to believe it too, which is why you see differently. You don't see, no matter how hard you try, you do not see like the world sees. No matter how hard you try, you cannot relate your spiritual things with them. You can't do it. But how much you want to. You can't be a part of them. You've already tried that. They'll not have you. You're the ones to be delivered. And you will soon see these steps of deliverance as part of the greatest exits anybody has ever seen before. You're going to live it. You're living it right now. That process has already been. So they saw all these things. Wait a minute, though. We're not done, though, because when they began to leave Egypt, God guided them, didn't he, directly? A pillar of what by day and a pillar of, and, a, and a column of what? Something supernatural in the heavens, guiding the children. They received their instruction via the living God through Moses, and God supernaturally stopped their enemies from pursuing them. He managed the whole thing, and he was still raising along the way how amazing is that that means in your time we're going to continue to see what we've been seeing but in an escalated form we've been seeing these kingdoms that this in, in america europe all these different places they can't avoid it things have pain the enemy is desperate and he's attempting to corrupt as many as he can corrupt so that you won't go so you can't go forward god won't force you to go forward See, that's key in this conversation. God will not force you to go forward, and you can indeed quit. You can quit at any time. But if you do that, have an understanding that those who endure until the end, those are the ones who are going to be saved. Why? Why won't he accept a person if they just, you know, don't go any, any further? I'll tell you why. In order for a person to stop, just give up everything and just stop, they have no faith in the resolve of Yahshua HaMashiach nor the Father. They cannot belong to him if they quit. See, when you believe in the Messiah's resolve, there's no way you're going to quit. Because if you accept the sacrifice of Christ, that's going to hit you like a ton of bricks. 
and you'll stand up and say, I will not dishonor the deeds of my Savior who gave his life for me. I will not quit because you will have accepted that sacrifice and it will mean everything to you if you truly believe. See, that brings up something else. When Moses was leading them out, when these things were happening, all of them did not have clarity in their understanding. But that was the next thing God was working on, giving them clarity of understanding. And in order for them to be clear in their understanding, God had to be very direct with them, didn't he? So they beheld his power. Oops, it says that in the Old Testament and the New Testament, that we would behold, we would see these things. Remember when Jesus said, remember what he said, the generation that sees all these things, begin to pass that generation, shall not pass and all things be fulfilled. In another place it says, when you begin to see these things, you begin to see these things come to pass. It didn't say when you finish seeing them. It said when you begin to see these things come to pass. Look up and lift up your head. You know what that means? That means you were looking down. If you look down, what are you looking into? The earth. To look up is not to gaze at the sky. To look up is to look away from the world. And to what? Not to gaze at the stars and the clouds and all that stuff, but to look up is to look towards your father. That means you were looking down the entire time. That means you were living your life by an earthly standard, mingled, mingled with the ways of men and of kingdoms on the earth. But in the Bible, Jesus said, when you begin to see these things, said, look up, look up. That means you were looking down. So if you're looking up now, you're looking towards what your father kingdom is established ways look up and it also said lift up your heads that means your head was down now when your head is down that implies what you're not very happy with where you were the truth is you're not happy in this world because it's not your home because the bible says you're in this world not of this world so how can a person be 100 percent happy in this world if this is not your home if you don't fit so when you look up and lift up your heads no more discouragement. So I like that part. To lift up your head is to walk with a surety. But you have to walk with a surety in something. And if God tells you to lift up your head, you better believe he's about to perform. And he will not fail to perform. If he tells you to lift up your head, no more depression. If he tells you to lift up your head, no more tiredness. If he tells you to lift up your head, you're not looking into the doom of this earth as your future but the deliverance granted by your father. The whole thing is changing. The world can't do that. The world cannot look up and lift up their heads. They can't do that. All they know is looking down into the ways of this world and everything they spew out of their mouths is mingled with the seasoning of this world. But when you look up, you're no longer looking down. Your hope is no longer tied to the end results of these things in the earth. But of those declared things of your Father in heaven. When you lift up your head, you're, you're, you're walking differently, living differently, not depressed, not down and in the dumps from all the disappointment this world has yielded. No matter how successful you think you were, you keep coming back down. And in order to stay up in this world, you have to do corrupted things to keep, to keep the money. A new standard is on the horizon. That's why you lift up your head. And if God said lift up your head, he has no intention of backing down on his declaration. That's a big declaration. If he's telling you to look towards it, if he's telling you it's coming, nothing will interrupt it. When God tells you something is coming, just like he, was, he told Moses to tell the people and to tell Pharaoh, that means God will not back down. See, the truth is, when Moses showed up, God wasn't playing, was he? He gave Moses instruction to give to Pharaoh. The march was about to happen, regardless if the people were ready or not. How do we know this? Because some of them got left. And when some were weakened halfway in the walk, did they stop? No, they did not. They kept pressing forward. As it turns out, those who had Egypt in their hearts were the ones that turned around. God kept going forward. Deliverance is deliverance. What does Jesus say in the end? He'll say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. If Jesus never knew them, they were none of his. 
There'll be no Charlie Browns in God's kingdom. Well, you know, I just couldn't do it. No, because if you accept the sacrifice of Christ, if you know what that sacrifice is and you truly accept the sacrifice of Christ, there is nothing that will ever have the power to make you dishonor that. See, because if somebody actually gives their life freely for yours, for your sin, for your darkness, for your stuff, if somebody gives their life, some innocent person, and I like the court example. I'll use it again. If you had 20 speeding tickets and they drug you into court and you were arrested and they said, listen, we're going to pass the sentence. You're going to spend two years in prison and you break down crying and everything else. But then somebody comes up, somebody you don't even, and you don't even know the person. And they tell the judge, I'll go serve the sentence. Just clear their name. And the only thing you know about this person is this person is wholesome, pure, innocent did nothing wrong full of love and instead of you going to jail and suffering the violence of prison they took your place so that you could go free if somebody did that in real life there's no way you could go home and throw a party your mind would be on that person who gave up their freedom who gave it all up and they didn't deserve it who took on your sentence because you messed up but they did nothing wrong that would plague you so bad that you would never dishonor that person who took your place in punishment. You would never, nothing could make you dishonor that person. Somebody could come up to you and say, oh, that person is just a, you know, a piece of something. You tell that person quickly. You would tell that person quickly that, that they need to leave or they might not make it out. You tell that person, don't dare dishonor that person. You tell that person the truth. No innocent person has ever taken on my punishment. No innocent person has ever made the choice to serve my sentence. There's no way you could dishonor that person. You think about that person every day of freedom you had. If somebody ever did that, well, see, Christ did that. And for those who know what Christ actually did, there's no way in the world they're going to give up to dishonor him to throw away his sacrifice he made for all of us there's nothing there is no power that can make you stop those are the ones that will endure until the end because the cross means everything to them those people who want to give up the cross did not mean much to them but when it means everything to you there is no power there is no obstacle no entity that can ever make you go backward and dishonor that gift that was given. That's why Christ says, and he will say in the end, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you because they never knew him. They never honored him. They spoke of him, but their hearts were far from him. When you accept Christ on the cross, in truth, you don't care how tired you get. You don't care what the price is because you know an innocent person freely gave up their life paid the price in full see in the bible it says you've been bought with the price you think that's a lie it's not some lie jesus suffered for you just for you don't look at everybody else look at yourself and everything you've ever done in secret in the dirt whatever the case is all uncleanness he took upon himself freely he was not forced and what he did, he did by real love. When people see that, you're going forward just like the time of the Exodus. Huh? The folks who recognized, wait a minute, this Moses jeopardized himself to come back here. First people, and God anointed him to do that. They followed him. They honored what God had put in him. They followed him. But see, some people valued Egypt over the living God. They did. And they only wanted to go back to their comfort. That's what they chose. And many of them died because that's what they chose. Still some, when they got free, they were eaten up with revenge. And all they could seem to focus on was destroying Egypt for what they did. That means they totally ignore God's deliverance of them. And instead of being thankful, they wanted to go back to punish those who inflicted things upon them. They were eaten up with revenge. 
In the Bible it says, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. The Lord commanded us, do not touch it. Don't touch vengeance. It's his. You see that, what the Lord did for us? He did by way of his love. What he did for us, nobody else would ever do. He paid that price in full. He even did it for those who would spit in his face, who would corrupt his sayings, who would start a cult utilizing his principles who would defile everything about them, Jesus died for them too, that they could have life, and to have life more abundantly. Well, guess what? To have life. We already had life. What does that mean? No. So it's not meaning being alive. That's not what that means. If you already had life, yet somebody comes to give you life, you know what that means, right? Fulfillment. To have life more abundantly is a tangibility. Fulfillment that's real, not some spoken fulfillment that nobody experiences. No, no. But fulfillment that can be experienced. It's coming and it's manifesting quickly. Very quickly. What do you think, uh, by way of the Holy Spirit, God spoke through many to give us an idea of what the end times would actually be like? Well, it's way of our fun. That means, don't be surprised at the destruction that you will see. Don't be surprised to learn of your new family. Everything in these kingdoms is falling falling apart. Why? It just so happens we live in a time of a very special generation. Very special. I hope that all of us would encourage each other in the truth to go forward, to look up, and lift up our heads. Notice also in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boastful, proud, blasphemous. It takes the grace of God to change us, folks. How can you be saved if you're not willing to repent? And the Lord Jesus Christ said, Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish.